I'd like to introduce the speaker now. Uh, Bonku, MD, MPP, is the Assistant Dean for Health and Design and an Associate Professor at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. He is a practicing emergency medicine physician and the founder and director of Jeff Design, a first of its kind program in a medical school that teaches future physicians to apply human centered design to healthcare challenges. Uh, Bonn has spoken widely on the intersection of health and design thinking. TEDx, South by Southwest, Mayo Clinic Transforms, Stanford Medicine X, Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, and serves on the Design and Health Leadership Group at the American Institute of Architects. In 2016, he received the Healthcare Innovators Award from the Philadelphia Business Journal. So please help me welcome Dr. Bonku to the podium. Uh, Thanks for having me here tonight. I want to thank the Center for Global Humanities at UNE, um, Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Muskie School of Public Policy, Creative Portland, and Adi Smith Ryman from the uh, Portland Society of Architecture. It's, um, it's a lot of fun to be here all the way from Philadelphia. I love Maine, so this is a um, thrill to be here. Cities are making us sicker. As a physician, I believe that making my patients healthier can only start with designing healthier cities. But before I talk about how we create healthy cities, I wanna share with you how I, with no background in architecture or design, as a matter of fact, got into uh, design thinking. And I wanna give some examples of how design impacts health, first on a micro level within hospitals, and then to go macro and to talk about how design impacts the health of communities. Because healthcare is not seen as a human right in this country, there are millions of us that lack basic insurance to protect us from the repercussions of illness uh, and disease. When I was in middle school, I used to skateboard a lot and I had severe left knee pain. I had to see an orthopedic specialist. And what I remember the most about that visit was my dad and he pulled out his wallet and it just seemed like this enormous amount of cash that he gave to the receptionist. I immediately felt um, guilt and sadness because I knew that was a lot of money for my parents because they were working at a flea market during that time and we uh, lacked um, health insurance. And I, I hated that medical care cost so much in America. I was the uh, first in my family to become a doctor. That's me with my sister. Uh, my mom and dad were immigrants from South Korea who never completed college. And growing up, we were, we were pretty poor. We were, we were nothing like these wealthy families in that <laughs> awesome movie, Crazy Rich Asians. If you haven't seen it, it's awesome. And like many immigrants who moved here, or at least are trying to move here, uh, my parents saw America as a land of opportunities. Their dream was for me to become a physician. But there was just one problem. I didn't enjoy sciences and I hated math. I actually sucked at math. And yes, I am an Asian male and that might surprise you, but no, we're not all good at calculus. Throughout my life, I was drawn to the arts and humanities. Much to my parents' horror, I chose to major in classical studies in college. And I loved translating the ancient poets. They captured my imagination. Organic chemistry didn't. After surviving medical training, in spite of my math incompetence, I worked, and I still do, in this emergency room that you see here in Philadelphia. And in hospitals, we use this secret language. You'll often hear this phrase in the emergency room, moving the meat. It's kind of terrible, isn't it? It refers to being efficient, to diagnosing and discharging patients as fast as possible. And I myself, I'm guilty of using this derogatory slang when trying to clear out a waiting room full of patients. And working in the meat grinder that is the emergency room, it's hard. And I've experienced burnout. These symptoms are emotional, physical, spiritual exhaustion lacking empathy, feeling dehumanized. And physician burnout, it's an epidemic in America. Everyone loses uh, with burnout, especially patients, because burned out doctors will deliver burned out care. 
How do we address this problem of burnout among physicians in, in America? The preventative strategies, they range everything from practicing yoga to participating in mindfulness programs, but it's a really complex problem. There's no easy solution. There's no magic antidote. Doctors can't yoga themselves out of burnout and into wellness. And I think with, in the case of my own burnout, uh, my treatment plan consisted into tapping into creativity. I felt that creative part of my soul go into hibernation during the years of rote memorization in medical school, the dehumanizing culture of residency training. And being creative at my job as a physician really helped me, I think, to get out of burnout. And I thought, you know, why can't we bring creativity to healthcare? You know, why do doctors always have to look outside of the house of medicine in order to be creative? And I actually think that making people healthier, making cities healthier, is a creative pursuit. So to move the needle in healthcare, we need to get creative, and we can do this by embracing design and health. Thinking about design made me see that I was that bad design existed everywhere in the products, the services, the spaces, the devices of healthcare. Think about your last experience as a patient. Were you sitting on a cold examination table like this, getting interviewed by a doctor who wasn't even looking at you, making eye contact because he was too busy typing away at the uh, computer? Or did you have trouble putting on one of those embarrassing patient gowns that has that opening in the back that exposes your butt? I've been practicing it for 12 years. I still don't know how to assemble one of these patient gowns when one of my patients asks me. And how many of us have been asked by a doctor's office or a hospital to fax in a medical form, <laughs> right? Uh, how many of us even own a fax machine? When I last worked in the emergency room, we use a fax machine. In fact, we use one during every shift if a patient comes from a different hospital that's not in our electronic health record system. The journalist Sarah Cliff calls the fax machine the cockroach of American medicine. <laughs> we, we don't have a technology problem in healthcare. We, we have a design problem. A few more of my favorite design fails in hospitals. Can you tell me the difference between the rectal and the oral thermometer probe here? They absolutely look identical. The only difference is on the top, one is red and one is blue. So the nurse has hacked a solution so you as a patient would not get a rectal thermometer inserted in your mouth. Imagine if this was your office. John is a physician's assistant and this is where he works every day in the hallway of the emergency department. He tells me that he constantly gets interrupted he gets bumped by stretchers, and the worst part of it, he's four feet away from a bathroom in an emergency room. It's like getting stuck on the back seat of the plane, always next to the bathroom. The bedpan is good when it's used for its intended design to collect feces and urine, but when I can't find a pelvic examination table in the emergency department, I need to perform a pelvic exam, we flip this over and then we put a female patient on it to do a speculum exam. This is a dehumanizing experience. This is one of the most sensitive exams that we perform on patients and we put them on a flip plastic bedpan. Design matters even in graphic design. This is that famous um, zero to 10 pain scale that you probably have gotten asked. You know, at a scale of 10, what's your pain? And it assumes that zero is the normal state, but if you are a patient with cancer or with chronic pain, you may never get to that zero. So as a physician, we spent, we did, we prescribed a lot of narcotics to get patients to that zero state. Healthcare needs to be uh, redesigned. And the same is true for medical schools. Medical schools were designed to produce doctors for the 20th century. The last major redesign actually occurred in 1910. So your future doctors, they're in lecture halls right now. They're freshmen, pre-med, and college. They were literally born in the year 2000. 
They know nothing of the 1900s, and they will be the ones removing our infected gallbladders, starting us on blood pressure medications, starting us on chemotherapy for our cancers. Um, in order to change the future of healthcare, I think we need to redesign how these future doctors are going to be, get trained. So I started the first program formally teaching design thinking within a medical school at one of the oldest and largest in the country. And we developed our own flavor of design thinking specifically for healthcare. In our forthcoming book, uh, my co-author, Ellen Lupton, she's a designer and curator, she defines design thinking as an approach for generating ideas and solutions that serve human needs. And the practice of design thinking uses prototypes, sketches, and storytelling to help teams build empathy and actively engage with the situation. And design thinking, it's, a, it's an open mindset. It encourages people to rewrite the rules of business as usual. And design thinking isn't for designers. Anyone can take part. Teaching design thinking to doctors and applying it to healthcare gave me fresh insight, deeper empathy for patients, and helped me to reimagine my role as a physician. And I want to share with you a few of my favorite principles of health design thinking. Prototyping, storytelling, and co-creation. Prototyping enables you to communicate the ideas in your head in a physical form. And when trying to improve the experience of this procedure of central venous catheter insertion, a team used everyday objects like Legos, cardboard, and Play-Doh to prototype a redesigned package for that catheter so that if you're a physician doing this procedure, it would be easier to, for you to find what you're looking for. When brainstorming solutions to improve sepsis care in hospitals, we sketched and mocked up a prototype for an interactive visual checklist that could remind providers to perform the critical actions needed in sepsis management. Sip simple prototypes like this can, can generate real solutions. So when we perform the critical actions, like taking blood cultures, administering IV antibiotics, we take off the red part, and that red stop sign turns to go. And it's helpful because as physicians, we experience a lot of alarm fatigue in the electronic health record, and sometimes we just need an analog form to remind us what to do. And remember that design fail I talked about, about the flip bedpan? Well, these medical students um, in, my, in my course wanted to redesign that experience for patients. So they built prototypes to redesign that pelvic exam uh, using, um, uh, they use a lot of plywood and a lot of screws. These prototypes allow them to build empathy for the end user. Nate John, he's one of my medical students, he has a much better sense of what a female patient goes through during a pelvic exam. Their final type resulted in this product, they call it Tilt, um, and they filed for a patent um, a couple of weeks ago on this product. Another design principle that we often use is storytelling. So stories do a much better job than data alone at inciting action. And one of the storytelling, one of the storytelling methods we use a lot is uh, storyboarding. And a storyboard explains action with a sequence of uh, pictures or images. And they're critical to my medical students when designing medical products and devices it helped them to validate their ideas even before they started building a prototype. This storyboard shows a device that a patient can use to position herself during, um, during epidural anesthesia to get that right lower bend in her back. And this team continually refined their prototypes of an ergonomic pillow that female patients can hug when getting an epidural. They, because they use inexpensive foam core for this, they were able to make dozens of prototypes and iterations on their product. Here, students storyboarded the problem of infected urine samples. Nearly 30% of urine samples are contaminated by bacteria. Uh, we, we've all given a urine sample here. It's a lot more difficult for a female patient than it is for a male patient, and the sequence of pictures shows that. This is the current standard of care for collecting a midstream urine collection. 
So this team redesigned this urine cup that hasn't been redesigned in over 50 years to collect uncontaminated urine samples. They also filed for a patent and their new product is called Flip Catch. It's a catchy name. And remember John, the physician's assistant that I showed you before. So I like John and many other providers. We hate the physical space in the emergency department. Uh, and rarely do we as frontline providers get to play a role in that design process uh, in where we work. Why can't doctors and architects co-create spaces? And co-creation means simply just designing for and with the end user and to go on the business as usual practice of designing spaces. So we decided to partner with an architecture firm, Kieran Timberlake, uh, one of my friends is a partner there. Their most uh, famous building was uh, the US Embassy in London, London that was recently completed. And what's most interesting about this firm to me is that they have a research division and they're actually not that big of a firm. And so that research division is freed up from always having to do work that only leads to billable hours. So I brought Billy Faircloth, one of the partners, into my emergency department and said, hey, Billy, help me out because your design can actually save lives here. This is the most chaotic indoor environment that probably exists in our city of Philadelphia. And she said, sure, let's, let's do something. A couple of years ago, we started a research project and we asked ourselves this question of, can design improve the delivery of healthcare? And what struck me first is that we lack basic tools to study and measure the impact of design on the built environment. It's like conducting uh, biomedical research without even having statistical software. You can't, in, you can't study the impact of design without the ability to measure it. So we brought our medical students and research students to um, Kieran Timberlake, uh, the architecture firm is uh, about 10 minutes from our hospital and we brainstorm research questions. And the first one we came up with is, can we measure how occupants move and behave in time in a hospital environment? And we started off first by applying a design principle of prototyping. So we prototyped a survey tool that looked like this. It's a, just a floor plan of the emergency room that I showed you. And we basically just re recorded our observations of what an actor in space was doing, what their behaviors were. And we were able to figure out that we were able to collect really robust data just with pen and paper. We observed and recorded how doctors, nurses, and patients move through the physical environment of the emergency room using uh, GIS software. We tracked what they did and where they did it. Our paper prototype eventually took on a digital format and we handed our students these iPads and they went around collecting data for two summers. Here are some of our data visualizations. This is a heat map of occupants uh, in the emergency department. And those big blobs right there that you see, that's a convergence of nurses and doctors and that's where the computer workstations are. So we see a lot of the workflow happens not at the patient bedside, but around the electronic health record, which is at a computer. This is a path of a nurse during a 12 hour shift. And we discover new insights. The nurses subjectively felt isolated in the popular pod design of emergency departments that, that exists because they were isolated, one nurse taking care of four patients in a separate area of the emergency department. And the nurses rarely spent time interacting with doctors because their workflow was at their pod in front of a computer. But if the delivery of healthcare is supposed to be done in teams, we really need to redesign the spaces in order to promote interaction and not to isolate. So doing this kind of research with architects inspired me. I started to geek out about maps and, and I thought, you know, 
are there opportunities to co-create with architects and designers outside of hospitals and in the community of Philadelphia? When we were brainstorming about creating a community health solution in Philadelphia, we wanted to make sure co-creation was a guiding design principle for us. As I said in the beginning, cities are making us sicker, and historically, there are many examples of how the design of cities make us sick. Overcrowded, poorly ventilated buildings like these led to widespread transmission of infectious diseases like uh, tuberculosis. The origins of public health uh, started in cities. It can be traced back to this map of London in 1854. By mapping the location of cholera deaths, Dr. John Snow identified a contaminated water pump, the famous Broad Street pump, as the cause for a major cholera outbreak. That discovery came about through mapping. Innovation in the design of cities, they dramatically change what we die from in cities. So instead of dying from infectious diseases like tuberculosis, cholera, malaria, yellow fever, we are dying from non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. We refer to this as an epidemiological shift. Modern cities, though, they are still making us sicker because they are designed to make us susceptible to chronic diseases. Uh, they increase our risk for diabetes and obesity and heart disease and stroke. Urban sprawl leads us to have more sedentary lives, limited access to healthy food, sets us up for obesity and diabetes. Philadelphia, we are the unhealthiest big city in America. Um, we struggle with extreme inequality. We have a 20-year life expectancy gap in our city. So if you live in the zip code on the bottom, that Strawberry Mansion, life expectancy is 69 years. If you live in that top zip code, life expectancy jumps up to 88 years. So where you live is actually the strongest predictor of how long you will live. Zip code beats genetic code at predicting lifespans. If you live in a zip code like this one in North Philadelphia, life expectancy, like I said, can be as low as 68 years. But just go three miles south to where those tall buildings are. That's where my hospital is. That's where richer people live. And that's where that life expectancy jumps up to 88 years. And the patients that I treat in my emergency room have shaped my understanding of public health more than any textbook or medical journal that I've read. Patients show me that health is highly geographic and that it changes from block to block. This statement by, the city planner, by a city planning pioneer led me to just rethink my role as a physician. No city is more healthy than the highest death rates. To treat the patient, not, it helped me to not just treat the patient before me lying in a stretcher in the emergency room, but to treat the community where that patient comes from. And we currently can't make communities healthier in our current healthcare delivery system because it's a, based on a sick care model where doctors get treated for, where we get, where we get paid for treating complications of diseases and not preventing them. We get rewarded for the quantity of services we deliver rather than the quality. So I've been taking my colleagues and students beyond the walls of the hospital and into these neighborhoods are located in the zip codes where life expectancies are the lowest in our city. We wanted to learn about the desires, wants, and needs of residents in those communities. We learned to appreciate the impact of the built environment on health. Philadelphia, we have about 40,000 of these vacant lots. They're, these trash fill lots, they are just more than an eyesore. They evoke feelings of anger, sadness, depression in the residents living near them. And researchers found that 
these vacant lots just decreased the sense of control that residents had over their lives. Dr. Charles Brandis, Brandis he's an epidemiologist at Columbia, he did this nice, elegant, randomized control trial, and you know, that is the gold standard of, of uh, clinical trials that we can do. What he did was he green vacant lots like this one and left other lots ungreened. Then he measured the heart rate of residents around those lots and found that they actually decrease. So the, the environment has actually a physiological impact upon the humans living near them. He also did a study that showed that by uh, fixing up the broken windows and doors of abandoned properties, we have about 50,000 of them in Philadelphia, led to almost a 40% reduction in violence around those um, abandoned properties. This map reminds me of Dr. John Snow's map of London, except the pathogen causing death is heroin, not cholera. This heat map of opioid-related deaths um, in Philadelphia shows the highest density to be in the Kensington neighborhood. And remember that quote from the city planner, no city is more healthy than the highest death rates in any ward or block. The health of Philadelphia should be measured by the health of Kensington and not of our richer zip codes. Kensington is at the center of the opioid crisis. In a recent New York Times article that came out, they called this area the Walmart of heroin. In Philadelphia, there were over 1,200 uh, deaths from drug overdoses in the year 2017 last year. The opioid epidemic is killing more Philadelphians than the height of the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. People travel from all different parts of the city, even from different states, to come to Kensington and they live in makeshift tent encampments like this one. These are commonplace throughout Kensington. In our conversations with Kensington residents, many told us that they wanted drugs out of their communities. Um, that's pretty obvious, but they also told us they were sick and tired of being stigmatized by heroin. Many of them were actually trying to live healthy lives. Not all of them were trying to get high. They wanted a different narrative for their community. They wanted things like access to healthy food, access to health care. They wanted safe areas for their children to play. We asked ourselves, how could we reimagine the public spaces in Kensington to promote health? So we went from mapping healthcare spaces to mapping playgrounds. It's because a landscape architect, Megan Talaroski, heard about our mapping work in hospitals and she asked us to embark on a research project with her to study the design of playgrounds in Kensington. Our team installed these white antennas around the perimeter of a playground in Kensington in order to measure the movement of playground users who wore bracelets embedded with those um, smart Bluetooth sensors. And our goal was to see if we could reliably measure the movement of kids in playgrounds using this technology. By directly linking behavior and physical activity to the infrastructural and environmental design of playgrounds, we can understand how people use space and what attracts them so that we could design better playgrounds, parks, and public spaces. Why can't the research to the design of playgrounds and parks be as rigorous as the research for a new drug or a medical procedure? Playgrounds are public health interventions. If kids play more, they will reduce their long-term risk of diabetes and obesity. Exercise beats any prescription medication for healthy living. Parks, they're supposed to be civic spaces for residents to enjoy green space, relax and play, but the parks in Kensington, they feel more like police states than civic spaces because of constant police presence. This is Hope Park in Kensington. It's pretty dangerous. I was told not to take this picture because we were being watched by drug dealers. It's so dangerous that the city parks and rec employees won't go here without police escort because they've been threatened so many times. Surrounding this park, which is in the center of this diagram, are hotspots of the most violent open air markets for drug trafficking. 
in McPherson Square Park, pictured here, there's a public library. And the librarians here made national news because they actually taught themselves to administer naloxone because there were so many people overdosing in the library and park. The librarians told me that they would have to revive people who overdose almost on a daily basis. So in Kensington, librarians are saving lives. We asked ourselves, can we use the concept of creative placemaking to change the narrative of public spaces? With architects, designers, nonprofit organizations, residents, we co-created a program called CoLab Philadelphia. We are repurposing a vintage 1960s Airstream trailer as a mobile open platform to engage the community. A lot of people ask us why in Airstream. Uh, they question us about the cost and practicality. And I answer, why not? It's cool and beautiful. Uh, why should only the hipster areas of cities get Airstreams? So this past summer, we placed uh, the Airstream in McPherson Square Park that I just met, mentioned, right next to the playground to create a safe space for residents. The poor often lack a voice in the development and creation of their spaces, and CoLab is an attempt at opening dialogue and amplifying the community's voice in their physical environment. We plan to launch a program that uses food as a change agent for healthy living, and we hope to deliver low-cost, made-from-scratch meals that compete against the fast food that's readily available in these neighborhoods. We want to design healthy addictions, and we plan to deliver these meals through this beautiful Airstream trailer in parks and street corners throughout Kensington. To me, designing for health, it's no different than designing for social justice. I, I believe that healthcare is a human right because what can be more unjust than dying two decades younger? Access to healthcare can help reduce this inequality, but it's not enough. We need to address all those non-medical factors, the social determinants of health like income, housing, and food access. I believe that the healthcare community can work alongside architects, designers, city planners, community members to reduce inequity in our cities and to redesign the future of health. Thank you.